We've all heard, read this passage several times, some people every word, but we've read this passage and have heard sermons based on this chapter, what, three to ten times in our life? Depends on how often we've been raised in church or, you know, how long we've read our Bible through. And every time you read it, you find something new. I always find something interesting about it. In this passage, you think about it, David wants to show kindness to someone of Saul's house for Jonathan's sake. When you think about this, it's a picture of grace. It's a beautiful passage of grace. But I want to show you something. I, I saw people preach about, you know, Mephibosheth, and he just lay him on his feet, and when he got under the table, he's like, everyone else, and praise him. Oh, welcome to Jesus. Woo! Made a new preacher. I've heard preachers like that. I've heard preachers where, where you know, David is... is where David is, is compared to God and he's in he's order Christ and people get saved come to Christ. I've read I've seen that before. I've seen about Lodi Bar, people going down to Lodi Bar, it's a bad side of the tracks. And we always say that Lodi Bar was a bad side of the tracks. There's a slums, we gotta go down and be a bus ministry. I've heard that sermon come out of this passage. I don't know how they did that, but they did it. I want to come from a totally different thing that I've never heard preach of before. And I'm not saying it's I'm not preaching anything different, but from a different perspective out of this passage. I want to preach about greedy, greasy grace. Greedy, greasy grace. David wanted to show this kindness to someone who was his enemy. To someone who, by all means, by all means necessary, would have been his enemy. I mean, you think about it, it was the house of Saul. Saul tried killing David. By all means possible, David, this was David's enemy. Of course, we know David never treated um, Saul's house as enemy. He always treated it with respect. He treated them as royalty. <laughs> All right, but um, David is shown here. David is, is as sh David has shown grace and favor both by the royals until greed intervened and ruined that relationship. He was he was in sh what in the world am I writing? He was shown grace by the royals until greed intervened. I mean, he was he was treated fair by Saul. Saul. Took him, took David to his own house, and he stayed with David. He stayed at David, uh, Saul's house. David was there with Saul, and he ate bread with him. And it was it was a close relationship, a close friendship. He was a family friend until greed intervened. Until you know, David has killed his, you know, Saul has killed his thousands, and David is tens of thousands, right? Until greed and a little bit of jealousy broke in and insecurity, then everything went crazy. But that happens if you find that that relationship was ruined by greed. Well, you see, greed is still there. Greed is still there in every relationship. There's still, and other people looking in see what relationships can be, and they have greed. I'm having trouble getting my, my plane off the ground this morning. The tragedy of this passage, and of this great passage about David looking out for the house of Saul, for Jonathan's sake, wanting to find someone he can show kindness to, a beautiful story, but you find tragedy within this passage, and that is because of Ziba. You find Ziba. You find Ziba is the tragic part of this. He had greed. He was greedy, and wanted a greasy grace. When you find this passage, Ziba was recognized as a servant of Saul. Now you can always get into symbolism, and don't get me wrong. When I, if I go to symbolic or or referencing back and forth, I realize that a person doesn't get saved by being another man's servant or employee. I understand that, okay? So bear with me if I if I mix laps, but give me some grace as I preach on grace, right? Ziba was recognized as a self servant. When we got saved, we were servants of sin. When we got saved, we were servants of our of this world. We were, some of us may have even, without knowingly, had been servants of the devil, not by purpose, but sometimes we do things that we don't understand, we're going the wrong way. I'm not saying, I'm not questioning the reprobate doctrine, so bear with me. What I am saying is, sometimes we're not the same playing field. We're not on God's side before we get saved. David is the king, and here's Ziba, and he realizes, and he goes to Ziba, he finds out there's Mephibosheth, who was the son of Jonathan, you know, relative of Jonathan, and he wanted to show kindness to him, and Ziba knew where he was. But look what it says in verse number 2. And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he answered, Thy servant is he. At some point, 
the servanthood switched. I mean, when, when David became king, the servanthood switched. And by the way, you can be saved, you can be a child of God, and still be serving the world. Just because you get saved doesn't mean you stop serving the world. Doesn't mean you stop serving sin. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. Jesus said, we got to stop saving to serve the world. we got to stop serving the flesh. we got to stop being servants of sin. we got to live, we reckon to ourselves dead, in, dead unto sins and alive unto righteousness, Amen. right? So we still need to make sure we take that in our life. People get this idea that when you get saved, all of your sin goes away. I wish I would get saved right now and lose 500 pounds. It would be great, all right? But it doesn't happen. We should try it. Hey, people think, hey, when you get baptized, automatically you become a magical creature. By the way, baptism's got nothing to do with salvation. But people expect baptism to be this magical catch-all. And it's not. And people are looking so much for a change. They made a spiritual decision. Okay, where's the proof? And they get their microscope, their microscope out and they watch and they wait. And it used to be about salvation, now it's about baptism. Baptism is like even more. Hey, they got baptized where they're not in church. They got baptized where they're not. Why is their life not straightening out? Because they're sold into sin. They're living their lives for themselves. They're not sold to the king. But when you make Jesus king, when you search him out, you say, I'm going to live my life and serve Jesus, we still sin, but we sin a whole lot less. And it's not because we're some super people. It's because our, we're, focusing, we're focusing ourselves for the Lord. October 11th, 1998, I was saved, I was having, I was away from the Lord, and I came to church, a preacher was preaching, 1011, right? Tim D, 1011. The guy is preaching, and he was preaching about making Jesus Lord of your life, and I was like, I'm going to make Jesus Lord of my life. The pastor confused it with getting saved. And I'm like, no. <laughs> Long story to it, but in my, heart, in my heart, that day, I got right with God. In my heart, that's the day where I got serious. I, 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 I got serious about serving God, about chasing the wrong people. There was one girl, she was, she was a co-worker of mine. I worked in the kitchen in the hospital, and we tried our best to make it beautiful. But the co-worker's daughter was, like, really a thorn in my flesh, and she was a, really a temptation, like, for all the wrong reasons. And I was so, like, being convicted because I was supposed to go on a date with her that week, and I, I didn't, I was like, I knew that God didn't want me to, date an unsaved girl, and I was like, doing my best not to, and I'm going to do it anyway, and I was just having a lot of, I was disobedient, I was a disobedient child of God, and I went to church that Sunday, and God just tore me up, just convicted me, the scriptures got to me, and I went to the pastor, and I remember, I remember getting things right with God, and turning to the Lord and saying, Lord, control my life, because I'm making some really bad decisions this quick out of the gate, I mean, Within three months of graduating and you know, high, you know, I get finishing school and going off on my own and working and working full time. I was making some really bad decisions, hanging around the wrong influences, and I never had that as in my life. I didn't have that friend. I didn't have friends growing up. No one my age. I didn't have any friends my age growing up. None. And now I'm starting to get friends my age, but they're all the wrong crowd. Offering me the smoke, offering me the drink, offering me to go on dates with women, girls that I do not have any business to go on a date with. Things like that. None. I had no purpose whatsoever. But that's the day I got right with God. I said, God, I'm making some terrible decisions in my life. I want you to, I want you to have authority. I want you to have the ultimate, the only authority in my life. And I got right. But um, I want to have, I want, I want to make sure that God, you're the only authority that I have in my life. And um. That was a big day for me. That was a special day. But, if, you know, you as a Christian, if you don't have God as your authority, as your only authority in life, if you're not trusting him and him alone, if you're not doing it his way, you're disobedient. You're disobedient. So get things right with God, right? But you see you see here, he becomes the servant of David. But that doesn't fix everything, because Ziba, from this point on, really does some kind of backhanded things. Ziba was recognized as a servant of Saul, and he was of the house of Saul by being a servant of Saul. Now you find that he's now a servant of David. You think about it. He asks and says, is there anybody left in Saul's house that I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? And Ziba says, yeah, I know the guy. He referred the fin of the, the George to David. He referred him to David. 
He was a headhunter. He referred him to David. Ziba was responsible for the welfare and the increase of Mephibosheth's house. He was solely responsible. He and his sons were responsible for Mephibosheth's increase. This would be a great story if this is where it ended. But it's not. Ziba failed the grace. He failed to see the grace. Ziba, Ziba got to be greedy. He, he, was, he was greedy, and he saw grace as being greasy. And he got it, and he went sideways with it. He, he didn't focus. Could you imagine if you were commissioned by the king, and your responsibility was to live of this person's house, take care of this person's house, be the butler, be the estate keeper, be the one who keeps in tra of keeping track of everything, make sure he's successful, all that he has, and you're in charge of it all. And that's your responsibility to go and grow this man's house. Take care of his kids, take you know, help take care of his children growing up, help take care of his his affairs, his animals, his, his livestock, his his goods, his farm, everything. It's you're, it's in his control. But Mephibosheth is coming to stay with the king. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome to think about. That Hey, I've got all the responsibility. That's a job promotion. I'm the, I've been recommended by the king. I've been put in position by a king. And I haven't been voted in. I've been appointed. That's a big deal. You know when you get voted in, you get voted out. But when you get appointed, it doesn't stop. Appointed doesn't stop you until you get fired. right? You, you can't, it's not by popular vote. It's by appointment. So here he's got this appointed, appointed. Um, he, says he gets this appointed job, and things would have been great from there, but he didn't. He took response. He had responsibility of all that Ziba had. But you find some things about Ziba that were not good. Things that about Ziba that are not things that we ought to have in our life. So beware of those things. First of all, we go to Second Samuel chapter number sixteen. Second Samuel chapter number sixteen. Absalom is an outright rebellion against David. He's, David is fleeing for his life. He's abdicating the throne. He's fleeing for his life. He takes off with his family. Absalom's coming to take over control. Absalom's unstable. David takes off to flee for his life. The Bible says he, he leaves. Chapter 16, verse number 1. And when David was a little past the top of the hill, behold, who? Ziba, the servant of who? Mephibosheth, George, right, met him. With a couple of asses saddled, and upon them were two hundred loaves of bread, and a hundred bunches of raisins, and a hundred summer fruits, and, and a bottle of wine. And the king said unto Ziba, What meanest be thou by these? And Ziba said, These asses be for the king's household to ride on, and the bread and the summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine that are that such as be as faint in the wilderness may drink. Well, that's pretty awesome. Stop there for a second. That was pretty aggressive, was it not? Here he was. He didn't ask permission. He was in, operating with the authority that he had to go and take the things of, Z, of Mephibosheth's household and to help take care of David. That was an aggressive decision to make. That was an aggressive decision to make. When you look upon the needs of others, you say, I'm going to meet these people's needs. I'm going to side with someone who, right now, the popularity is against this person. Popularity is against David, but you know what? I'm going to do what's right. I'm, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to do what I think is best, and I'm going to take care of David because Absalom was an outright was an outright rebellion. I'm going to take this from David, and I'm going to, I'm going to take these to David, and I'm going to kind of side with David apart from Absalom. David's my meal ticket. I'm going to stand with David. David put me in this, appointed me as leader, uh, overseer of this house. David put me in, in this position. I'm going to back David, and he did that. Against Mephibosheth, but I mean, against Absalom, excuse me, you find that. But here's the thing: he was always he was very aggressive, and that he met David mid-flight. I mean, as they're running again, as they're as they're as they're escaping Absalom, he meets up there with a whole bunch of supplies. Didn't ask permission. Didn't ask. He had full reign of this. He was very aggressive in his decisions, and he gave him trail mix. He gave him a little snack pack. He gave him some. Here's some, you know, some some drink for the wilderness. Here's some summer fruits, and here's some raisins. Give you a trail mix. Happy trails. There you go, buddy. 
But he was pretty aggressive in what he did towards David. And he brought some donkeys along the way. And he said he helped David out in that vine. You also find that Ziba was assertive. By the way, it's not wrong with being aggressive and helping other people out. But here's the thing. Don't be aggressive to that which isn't yours. If it's not yours, don't be aggressive towards that. I learned this in my life. Just because I have authority over something doesn't mean I have to be partakers of those things. There's a situation that, that I, I was part of, and I, I did something I thought was best to do. And I did it within my with what I thought was my authority. But I was free with what wasn't mine to give, even though I had authority over it. It's not, it's not an evil, wicked thing, but it was kind of like it wasn't the best choice. Be careful as an employee what you're assertive. You know, while you're trying to make that, why, you know, it's like, I'll use Daniel for an example. While you're there working at work and you're doing your absolute best to, to meet everybody's orders and you do everything you can to be the best employee you can to bring profit to your boss, right? To profit to your employer. You're doing your absolute best, right? Don't do it free-handed. Well, you know what? If you buy two waffles, if you can buy two waffles, if you buy two, if you buy two sandwiches, I'll get you a free fry. Well, if it's a coupon, if, it's, if, it's, if that's what the structure is, great. But sell, great. But you can't start mixing and matching and making sales. It's not yours to make. You can't make those. You can't make those deals. It's not yours to make. You can be a super. We can be super free-handed and super lax on things that don't matter to us. At the end of the day. We need to make sure we're making profit to our managers, to our employers. Make sure we're doing the things that are well. But Zebo was aggressive. Zebo is also assertive. He took supplies and the substance to assist the king. Not only did he meet him at the, at the you know in the middle of the guy the king's escape and trying to take off. Not only did he meet them halfway in flight, but he also brought substance to assist the king. And he came mid-flight. He was assertive. He didn't wait. He didn't wait for the king to get settled. He met him mid-trip. He met him midway, at the top of the hill. The king was on his way out. He came and met him. He goes, what's this about? He goes, this is for you guys to get out of town. Not only was it an aggressive that he, that he took the king, that he took Mephibosheth's supplies, but he met him mid-flight. I mean, he could have been killed. He could have been considered an enemy. Here's the combatants all around, and he meets them out that way. He was assertive. He didn't think about the consequences of what he was doing. He was just assertive. That's not so bad. That's not so hey, it's not what's so bad about that. He was assertive towards that end. He was doing his best to help other people, but he did it at the cost of Mephibosheth. Now the problem with this is, in all of this, he does not support Mephibosheth. He only he only supports himself. Look what it says in chapter number 16. Verse number what? Verse number five? Sorry, verse number three, excuse me. And the king said, And where is thy master's son? And Ziba said unto him, and the king and said unto the king, excuse me, Behold, he abideth at Jerusalem, for he said, Today shall the house of Israel restore to me, uh, restore me the kingdom of my father. Whoa. Now, if I'm operating, I say, hey, you know what? My boss wants me to take care of the king. My boss sent me hit mid-flight, you know, mid-trip with mid-trip with the supplies and all these and all these provisions. And hey, I'm I'm here. And if I was assertive and I was if I want to be assertive and I want to be aggressive and the, because my boss told me to or to make my boss look good, that's good thing. But he was aggressive and assertive for the wrong reasons. He was aggressive and assertive to bring shame to his boss. He was aggressive and, ass and assertive to bring shame to Mephibosheth. That's where he went wrong. And this, he was, and everything he did was for the wrong intentions. Everything he did was wrong. It was for the wrong intentions. Being aggressive is not a bad thing. Being aggressive for the wrong reasons is. You want to go out there and go soul winning? Awesome. Praise the Lord for it. It reminds me of these guys. And look, I don't know the whole story to it, but I know what's on both, what both sides have said. During the first mega marathon, some people went to to the church in Idaho, or whatever, where Sam Gibb was, where Sam Gibb was camp on the camper, and they went out purposely, left like eleven tracks on the door of that church where Sam Gibb was, and knocked on his trailer and left tracks on the trailer, knowing full well it was Sam Gibb. 
That was aggressive. Now look at Sam Gipp. That guy's messed up. I don't support Sam Gipp. I think he's wrong. I think he's a false preacher. But really? Really? I remember being 16, 17, and the youth pastor went on a, on a mission, went, went to youth conference, technically, in Indiana. And while we were there, the youth pastor and the pastor took us on their old bus, on their old bus, um, bus routes, where they had the bus routes for Sunday school and stuff. And then we walked around and visited, you know, looked around some of the sites, and and we, there's this big old massive Catholic church. And the youth pastor's like, I dare to go in there and take out one, you know, and extinguish all the flames in the candles. Go out and blow up the candles. <laughs> well, I'm 16, 17 years old. I can swing over hell on a water pistol and split the devil in his eye. I'll do it in a heartbeat. Let's do it. So I went out there full of zeal, and I went into the church, and I blew out all the candles that people were lighting for the death of the loved love, love, love ones. Really? Aggressive? Do you think God's going to honor that, that I blew out candles for people that really? I mean, we can be so assertive. We can be so aggressive, but for the wrong reasons. We can go out and, boy, that, that you know, here, you know we're all, we've all been that person. We're out door knocking, right? And here we come to the apartment, to the car, apartment complex, and it says office. Now, 50 50 percent of 50 percent of us are like, you know what? We're gonna bypass this door and wait till we head up on the way out. We're not gonna buy, we're not gonna bother the manager until after you're done doing the soul winning, right? Anybody like that? How many of us are like, you know what? Forget it. I'm just gonna go to jail right now. <laughs> right? There's some people do that. I remember when I was in when I was in uh, the grand opening for Revival Baptist uh, for down there. At, I think it's a grand. Anyways, we were down there in, in, in Florida at Revival Baptist, and, and uh, I was in this apartment complex with some of the guys from some of a couple of the cooks from um, All Scripture Baptist, and then we were across the road was Marcel and uh, all, a bunch of other guys from Jacksonville, and they went right up to the golf cart where the manager was and started witnessing to the manager, not witnessing anymore, now debating and arguing First Amendment rights. And I'm like, you idiots. And I'm like, just go so winning. Oh, I'm going to call the police. Well, you don't get ready to call the police. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. No, no. They're being so assertive, but for the wrong reasons. They're going so winning for the wrong reasons. They're going and doing these things for the wrong reasons. Can I tell you? We ought not be that type of person. We don't be assertive for the wrong reasons. If we're doing it for the glory of God, yes. But make sure it's with grace, it's with humility. Make sure it's for the right purpose. Not to show how great we are in doing it. Ah, bless God, I'm going to find the newest reprobate, bless God. I'm going to search every sermon preached this past week and see if I can... Whoa, what are you doing? I'm being aggressive, I'm being assertive. Search the scriptures, not other people's lives. Okay, stop. You're being... What it is is that people are looking at the grace of God, they're considering it greasy, and they're greedy of the grace of God in other people's lives. We're guilty of that ourselves, aren't we? Ziba failed to see the grace of God in his life. That even with Ziba's life, the grace that was in his gift, the grace of God in his own life, manifested in David, making him the head of that household, taking care of all that he was, giving him that responsibility. That was the grace of God. But he became greedy of the grace and wanted instead to overthrow Mephibosheth. That is messed up. What a beautiful story of grace that David would take someone who would have been his enemy to go out and find Mephibosheth and have him come and live in his house and take care of him for Jonathan's sake. Beautiful story of grace. And then there's Eva. There's Eva. Watching David. In a beautiful story of grace, there's always tragedy. Look for it. There's always something happening. The prodigal son. What a great story. Would you not agree? I mean, said the prodigal son ran away. Prodigal, the prodigal son was squandered all of his living, with all of his substance of riotous living. Said that he wound up living in a pig pen and taking care of the swine, eating after the swine. But then he came to himself. And he says, you know what? My father's servants have better here. I'm going to go and arise and go to my father and ask him to make me a servant. The father sees him a great while off. By the way, the father knew where he was, but never came down to where he was. Sometimes you can't help the person. They've got to wait for that person to come to themselves. And he came to himself, and the father, he saw the father saw him, and he came running to, his, running to his son. He fell on his neck and kissed him and hugged his neck and just let to see him. Killed the fatted calf, gave him a robe and a ring, 
What a beautiful story. Would you not agree? Awesome story. The father brought him back and kept him as a son, not as servant. Loved him, brought him back in a place of authority. Benefited him, strengthened him, loved on him. Acted like he never left. That's not where the story ends. The older son sitting back out. I ain't get a fatted calf. I didn't get no ring. I didn't get no robe. I didn't get no party. No birthday cakes, no shindig, no nothing. And he said out their power. And the father goes out to him and says, Son, all that I have is yours. Everything that I have is yours. Everything. But your brother, he was lost. But now he's found. And the story ends without knowing how the brother turned out. Well, you read your Bible, you know how it turned out. Israel provoked a jealousy. They failed to come to Christ. They failed to come to Christ. They provoked a jealousy. All that God has is given to the church because of Christ Jesus. Not because of it, not because of by birth, but by by the grace of God. We see how the story plays out. But Ziba failed to see the grace of God in his own personal life, and he became so greedy of the grace of Mephibosheth's life. Quickly, let's read the rest of the story here. It says in verse number 5, sorry, verse number 4, And the king said to Ziba, Behold, thine are all that pertained unto Mephibosheth, and Ziba said, I humbly beseech ye that I may find grace in thy sight, my lord, O king. Hey, Mephibosheth messed up. He lied against Mephibosheth. He, uh, he, he lied against Mephibosheth to David. He was antagonistic. He pitted David against Mephibosheth and Mephibosheth against David. Go to 2 Samuel chapter number 19. 2 Samuel chapter number 19. Look at verse number 24. Absalom is dead. David's coming back to Jerusalem. He's coming back to his kingdom. He's coming back to the throne. Verse number 24. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king and had neither dressed his feet nor trimmed his beard nor washed his clothes from the day that the king departed unto the day that he came again in peace. Does that sound like someone who is waiting for the kingdom to be restored to him? He was mourning. He was scared. He was mourning. He was worried about the king. And it says in verse number 25, And it came to pass when he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king, that the king said unto him, Wherefore wentest not thou with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, O king. And he says, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For thy servant said, I will saddle me an ass that I may ride thereon and to go to the king because thy servant is lame. And he, and he hath slandered the, the servant unto my lord the king, but my lord the king is an angel of God. Do therefore what is good in thine eyes. For all of my father's house were dead men, were, were, were but dead men before my lord the king. Yet thou didst not, uh, did, but yet, yet didst thou set thy servant among them that did eat at thine own table? What right, therefore, have I yet to cry any more unto the king? He says, I wasn't trying to go against you. But I can't walk, I'm lame. And Ziba was supposed to be with me a donkey. He said, I sat on the animal, a donkey and ass, so I could ride on it. So I could go with you. And instead of coming to get me, he took off. And he slandered me to your face. He slandered me to your face. He says, you know what? I want back everything that I had. I was on your side the whole time. I want everything that I lost to be restored to me. That's not what he said. He says, but David, you're an angel of God. Whatever you say is right. Whatever you do is right. Whatever you decide, I don't, I deserve anything. I don't deserve anything good in my life. You've already been so good to me. All the grace that you've given me, I don't deserve it. And I'm not asking for any more grace. I just want, I just, I'm glad you're safe. I'm glad you're okay. I'm glad you're there. But Ziba was so antagonistic, he was willing to, the, the antagonism he had, he was willing to pit a brother against brother. 
He was willing to take a servant against the, against the king. He was willing to take a Christian against God. Doesn't the Bible tell us that's what a slander does? That's what a slander is? Isn't that what the Bible tells us that Satan is? He's the accuser of the brethren. Isn't that one of the things that God exactly hates, that God such with such strong words hates? It's an abomination to him that sows discord among the brethren. What happened was he wanted the grace of God, but he wanted it with grease. He wanted the greasy grace of he wanted, he wanted God, he wanted the greasy grace. Instead of the grace of God, he wanted favor that was not due. He wanted favor that was unjust. He wanted a favor by tearing down other people. He wanted a favor by misguiding people. He wanted to attack and get rewarded for it and causing division, causing strife. And he wanted to be rewarded over it. Second, second Samuel chapter number 19. Look at this down here in verse number verse number uh, 29. And the king said unto him, why speakest thou any more of thy matters? I have said, Thou and Ziba divide the land. And Mephibosheth said unto the king, Yea, let him take all, for as much as my lord is come again in peace unto his own house. Mephibosheth's attitude is never against the king. Mephibosheth's attitude is never against that authority. Mephibosheth's attitude was, Hey, I'm glad you're safe. I don't deserve anything you've ever given me, God. Hey, Christians, we don't deserve we don't deserve anything God has ever given us. Anything good that we've ever gotten from God, we do not deserve. And if we never get anything else from God, we have enough to shout on for credit. We have enough to thank God from here in eternity because of all what He has. You know when people defraud me, I have a hard time. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I don't want to be defrauded. I'll I'll close these with two illustrations. I was in Florida and I was going to college and I was working right alongside the other guys and I was working so hard, being there every shift they were working, working just as hard as everyone else. And the manager gave everybody else a raise but me. There is one guy that never showed, showed he called off all the time. And when he was there, he had a bad attitude, he destroyed stuff, and this guy got a raise. I didn't get a raise. I was a I was beside myself. I was frustrated. I worked just as hard as everyone else, if not more. And I didn't get a raise. And it took me about a week. And I had a bad attitude at work and everything, and I was so upset. I remember going in later after the manager and apologizing to him. I said, you know what? You gave me a job. You told me I was going to get hired for this amount of money at these many hours, and I worked these many hours and more at this pay raise. You've done exactly what you said you're going to do. And I'm thankful for working here. Thank you for letting me work here. But it took me a while to get to a place where I was not any more jealous about what other people had. I got exactly what, you know, God gave us exactly what he said he was going to do. If we came to God by faith and gave us salvation and we're walking with the Lord and he gives us one talent, why are we jealous of the three or five? Yeah, I would love to have a church of 200 people I don't have to work. Then I can be a real fat loader. I'm thankful for what God has given me. I'm thankful for the people that are coming here. And if I go down to three people, I'm thankful for what God gives me. But I want to be faithful whether I have three people in the church or whether I have 250, 300 people in the church. I want to be faithful to what God has given me. Because that's what God has assigned me to do. That's what God has hired me for. That's what God has appointed me to be. It's to be here no matter how many people I have or how many few people I have. That's what God has given me. And I'm going to do my very best towards that. Other people get bigger churches. You know what? Praise God for them. Other people get new churches. Praise God for that. Other people get so-and-so. Praise God for that. But in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, if we're so looking upon what other people have and not content with what we do have, and, we're, and we've got to be so aggressive and assertive for the wrong reasons, and then we're antagonistic and trying to pit people against people and trying to tear each other down, that's not of God. And Ziba fell in that situation. We never see Ziba getting right with Mephibosheth. We never see anything. Ziba got everything. Because Mephibosheth said, you know what? I'm glad you're okay. You've done enough for me. I can never ask you for anything else. I don't deserve anything you've gotten. I'm glad you're okay. We don't find anything else in Mephibosheth. 
Did he get his land back? Did he get his house back? Did he live in the king's house? We don't know. Nothing is said. Nothing is said ever again. Be careful that while we're so assertive and antagonistic, so assertive and aggressive, that we become so antagonistic that we cause so much damage that people can't get back to where they were. That we destroy people's character and integrity and reputation and they're placing that we can never, they'll never be used like they were again. They'll never have the relationship like they had before. I mean, David's like, okay, great. Well, you, you and Z, but take care of those things over here. I'm not whatever. I'm just kind of, it's dead to me. The situation is dead to undone. David doesn't wage war. David just hands off. It's done. Whatever. Did Mephibosheth could come back and sit at the king's table? Does he say that? He could have. That would be a great picture of grace. That even when we lie about the standard about the king still believes us. The king didn't believe him. Hey, why don't you come right away? David believed a lot. That's rough. That's rough. Make sure in our life that we're not so greedy, that we're not so greedy of people's greasies, greasy, and of people's grease and call it grace. Right? Make sure we're grateful for what God has given us in our life. Don't look for the grease of other people and think that's of God. The Bible says that God sends sunshine and, and on the just and on the un, you know, sun's rain on the just and unjust alike. Don't think just because that person over there is living in sunshine that hey, just because he's got grass that's green on his side of the yard doesn't mean you're not living doesn't mean he's getting more blessed more than God. Hey, some people are gonna have their best life now on this earth. This is the best they got. This is what they're getting. Ours is so much better. Don't be greedy like Ziva. Don't miss God's grace in our life and the things that God has done in our life. Well, I'm just second fill. Great, you're not third. Be thankful for what God has given us and be content with such things we have. God said, I'll never leave you, no forsake you, right? Hebrews chapter 13, paraphrase, verse 5. So let's have that in our hearts and minds this evening, or this today in our life. Let's go to close in a word of prayer. I'll ask Brother Daniel to pick out a song to close us in prayer. And